Today on the Wait a Second, Am I Cheap? Says podcast, I'm going to be trying to make a lavalier microphone sound better. I'll be discussing the differences between microphones and cups of coffee, which may sound insane, <laughs> but I assure you it will make sense and other stuff too as my AC turns on. So go ahead and stick around. <laughs> Let's start with the whole trying to make a lavalier microphone sound better thing. And this is something that I have been working on and thinking about and testing for months at this point. I went on an entire story arc on this podcast months ago, but I was thinking more about it and doing a few more tests. And I wanted to share those tests with you. So let's jump to something I recorded hours ago. I'm fully aware that I went on my lavalier microphone story arc a couple of months ago, but I wanted to do another test and I figured, hey, I'm going to record it. I'll share it with you. So right now I have the Sennheiser ME2 about seven inches or six inches below my mouth in the center of my chest. This is what I determined to be the best sounding tonally. And then I also have the Neumann, hello Neumann, KM185, a hypercardioid SDC, I would say about 10 inches from my mouth. Now back to the lav mic, back to the lav mic. The issue I have, I record sitting at a desk. So although this is the best sounding tonally, in my opinion, other than putting it on my cap, it picks up the worst amount of reflections directly off the desk because it's also really close to that. So that is an issue that we run into when we put the microphone where it sounds best tonally. It also sounds the worst, worst in terms of reflections. So instead, I want to try putting the lav mic on the collar of my hoodie, getting it closer to my mouth and further away from the reflective surface to see if we can then EQ it in post to sound a bit better, to sound more like it's in the center of my chest, while simultaneously reducing the amount of reflections being picked up by it. Because the tone is something we can alter, but removing all the reverb that's being picked up or the reflections off of the desk, that is extremely difficult. And if you can do it at all, it is incredibly destructive. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. I'm going to have turned on an EQ to see if we can get it to sound better. And the reason I have the Neumann set up is I wanted to try to EQ match the LAV to the SDC to see if we can get it to sound better that way. That way I don't have to spend 20 minutes trying to EQ it to sound better. I can, I can just let the, the EQ just match it. it. Saves me a bunch of time. So that is the test. Let me know what you think if you're watching this or listening to this on YouTube. Do you think it sounds better being clipped to the collar of my shirt? Without EQ, it will sound a lot duller, a lot deader. But once we engage the EQ, does it sound better? And more importantly, do the amount of reflections decrease? And does it sound better in that regard when the microphone is on my collar, which is what it is right now, versus when we have the lav mic clipped to the center of my chest about six or seven inches below my chin, where the microphone is able to get a more direct line of sight to my mouth and avoid what I have heard called a chin shadow. Does it sound better here or on the collar? That's the test. Okay, back to the podcast. I don't know about you, but I am a little bit surprised by the results there because I wasn't expecting to get such a good sound out of having the love on my collar. I know I've been saying this a lot over the last couple of years. It seems as though I've been living in a lie. What is going on? Why don't I test everything and come up with my own opinions on stuff as opposed to just trusting everything that comes towards me? I still think using a small diaphragm condenser sounds significantly better than a lav mic, 
but if you are forced to use a lav mic in a very non-ideal environment like sat at a desk in front of a computer monitor where all of that is just going to reflect your voice right back at the microphone, I think it's okay to have the lav mic on your collar and get a little bit duller of a sound as opposed to having it in the proper position in the center of your chest where the microphone is significantly closer to a super duper reflective surface like your desk. I think it's the exact same reason why you don't want to use a shotgun microphone and under boom when you're sat at a desk because the reflective surface is right next to the microphone, which is going to make those reflections significantly louder. So with lav mics, given that the majority of them are omnidirectional, I think that the placement of the microphone is an even more important part of the equation than the tonal portion of the equation. Because yes, you may get a better tone with the lav placed seven inches below your chin in the center of your chest, but that introduces a world of pain and hurt in the form of reflections and reverb, which is even more difficult to resolve than a little bit of darkness in the tone. You can easily brighten up a microphone, still not gonna sound great, especially compared to a full-sized small diaphragm condenser or a large diaphragm condenser. But between the two options in this situation, sat at a desk in front of a computer monitor where there is a bunch of reflections going on, I think I'm going for putting the microphone on the collar, which is not advocated for. I think it sounds better. Call me crazy, maybe so. I'd much rather add a little bit of EQ than have to try to go in and de-reverb something which is 10 times more destructive than a high shelf. That is me trying to make a lavalier microphone sound better. Now let's jump to what I've been testing. I've been testing two microphones. Surprise! I am still using the Sennheiser ME2. And instead of running it through the Rode AI Micro, I'm actually recording into the Zoom F2, which is a 32-bit floating point, 3.5 mil recorder, if I remember correctly, and that's what I'm doing there. The, the SDC I'm using is the Neumann, the KM185. This is a hypercardioid SDC, and I just pulled this out because I was filming the next podcastage video and I didn't want to have a bunch of SE microphones. I wanted a little bit of variance. I didn't want to say SE, SE, SE. So I pulled out the Neumann and I've used the 184 a bunch. Figured I might as well use the 185. It's a $900 SDC, so it's 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 up there. It is way up there. But what do you think of the sound? And I maybe I will have been switching back and forth between the lav and this throughout this podcast. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what I choose to do. Maybe, maybe I'll do the whole thing on the on the lav mic except for this portion. Something I have noticed about the lav mic, this is no surprise to anybody, but the self-noise of it is it is so apparent. It makes SDCs, which have a high self noise, sound dead silent. <laughs> it sounds, it makes the preamp noise with dynamics sound non existent. There is just this constant shh on the lav mics that I have used. And that's no surprise to anybody if you've ever looked at the specs, but actually just jumping back and forth between them, it becomes so much more apparent. All right, that is what I have been testing. Let us jump to what you had to say. First comment comes from Nathan Vluegels1, they say. Instead of reamping to test microphones, I use a looper pedal. Does basically the same thing, and it has the added advantage that it makes it super easy to test amps and amp settings, even in live situations without having to record anything. 
Nathan, thank you very much for the comment. I really appreciate it. And your stance makes perfect sense. In the past, I have actually used looper pedals, which I have. I'm going to grab it right now. Is this my looper pedal? I have two of them. Why do I have two looper pedals? I have no idea. I have two looper pedals. And in the past, they're the same brand, just different versions of the looper pedal. In the past, I have used these for the exact thing that you mentioned, being able to not have to record into a computer and just loop the same thing over and over again. I've done this for microphone comparisons. The reason that doesn't work for me anymore is unfortunately I made the stupid, stupid decision to spend too much time making those test songs. So I no longer just have a single guitar part because I want to hear the lower frequencies of a microphone as well as the higher frequencies of the microphone. What that led to me doing is recording a left-hand guitar part, a right-hand guitar part, and then a lead guitar part. So with these looper pedals, having three guitar parts would be a huge pain in the rear end to do properly. So the simplest solution for me is the reamping, record the DI, get that, and then send each of those takes out into the amp and then capture that with each microphone. So that's why these ditto pedals no longer work for me because I like suffering. And instead of simply doing the easy thing, I, I like to challenge myself and say, okay, how can I make this a song that I actually want to listen to? How can I make this a song that has three different guitar parts, which I think play nicely together? So that is why loopers don't work for me. And thank you for the suggestion. I really appreciate it. But for me, that just ain't gonna cut it. So we're going down the deep dark hole of learning another recording technique called reamping. All right, next comment we have comes from Flood of Sins. They say, you spend hundreds, if not thousands for microphones, and at the same time, you're worried about four to $8 coffees, what's one full-time job and two income producing YouTube channels. That makes absolutely no sense. Flood of Sins, thank you very much for the comment. I really do appreciate it, especially because you are giving me the opportunity to get on my soapbox, go on a rant, as well as share some math with you. So if anybody is listening to this and hates the fact that I'm about to share some math, blame Flood of Sins. This is all on him. This is his fault. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is the use of the term worried I don't think that's correct at all. Worried would imply that I'm sitting here, oh gosh, oh no, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do? It's like the meme, the guy who has two buttons to push and he's sweating, wiping his brow. One says $8 coffee. One button says $8 coffee. The other button says 30 cents coffee. That's not the situation. <laughs> that is, that's not me. I just said, oh, that doesn't seem like a price that I want to pay for that. Okay, let's go on about our life. To me, that doesn't sound like worried. That just seems like understanding the value you're receiving from something and choosing not to waste your money. In my opinion, I am choosing not to waste my money on stuff that I see no value in. That is different than worrying. Secondly, Let's go ahead and address this idea of it not making sense. If me not spending four to eight dollars on a cup of coffee doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. But for me, it makes perfect sense. Even though I do work a full time job, even though I do have two YouTube channels which earn me income, even though that's the case, it still makes sense to me to say, I'm not going to spend $8 on that. Instead, I'll get the hotel to give me coffee. Instead, I'll brew my coffee at home and spend 30 cents. That makes perfect sense because I understand how much work goes into me earning four to eight post-tax dollars. So now let's get into the math. And this is super fun. For this example, let's assume 
I earn an hourly rate of $30. That may be a bit high for some people, but let's say $30. When that income comes in, first thing I do, let's set aside 30% to retirement. That is pre-tax dollars, so that decreases our taxable income. What we have left after that, 21 bucks. We're taking home $21, wrong. We have to pay 20% tax on that. So 20% off of that leaves us $16.80 for one hour of work. But once we get that, we still need to set aside 10% of that for a rainy day, for some kind of emergency. So that leaves us with about $15 for every one hour of labor. And this is very liberal here. I am not accounting for insurance. I am not accounting for any bills, anything. This, is, <laughs> this assumes I don't have rent, I don't have electricity, I don't have any of that. That I could, I could spend 100% of what I take home, which is not the case. So assuming my actual spendable income, my discretionary spending is $15 per hour, I could choose to say, okay, I'm going to work 30 minutes to pay for this cup of coffee. Or I could say, I'm going to work one minute to earn the 30 cents to pay for this cup of coffee. To you, that may seem, oh yeah, I'll, I'll work 30 minutes for that. The way that I view it though, would I prolong the amount that I have to work until I retire by 30 minutes? One time, no problem. But if I'm going to Starbucks every single day, spending eight bucks, extending the amount of time that I have to work until I can retire by 30 minutes, after a month, you're adding multiple days that you will have to work to recover that income. Of course, that assumes you are planning for retirement. So that is how I am looking at it. To you, it may not make sense. You may look at what I earn and say, you have plenty of income. Why don't you just go out and spend this and buy that and do this, travel there? Because I am very fiscally conservative. I like saving. I didn't, let me rephrase. <laughs> let me rephrase. I do not like saving money, but I do it because it's responsible. I do it because I want to ensure that I am able to retire and I want to ensure that I do not become a burden on my family or other people in this country. I want to make sure that I can pay for myself if I ever get to the point where I retire. Now let's look at the business side of things. <laughs> that, that's the math. We're done with the math. If you were scared of math, we're done. Let's look at the business side of things. You say I spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on microphones. That is absolutely correct. I am using a $900 microphone there. I have a $120 microphone on my lapel. I have a $1,600 or $1,800 microphone here. I have a $500 mic there. There's a, another $900. There's, yes, I spend a lot of money on microphones. So what is the difference between a microphone and a cup of coffee? <laughs> I run YouTube channels where I discuss microphones. I review microphones. I demo microphones. I do whoosie whatsies and whatchamacallits with microphones and I publish videos. Those videos get views. Those views translate into income for me. So the income from the videos discussing these microphones offsets the cost of the microphones and hopefully more so. Otherwise, the IRS is going to be mad at me. They want their cut. So I make sure that I stay profitable. I don't overextend my business income on microphones. I stay in, the, what is it? I stay in the black. That's why it's Black Friday. I make sure that I don't overspend. But I am okay spending money on microphones because, yes, it's fun for me, but also because when I make these videos, I earn some of that expenditure back. 
when it comes to cups of coffee, nobody is paying me money. <laughs> to, nobody is giving me money to drink coffee. So if I spend eight dollars. There's no way for me to recover that cost, and if I do that over an entire year, every single day, eight hundred six. That's twenty four hundred bucks that I'm never gonna recover. More than that, I just did three hundred times eight. But you get the point. So that is the very significant difference between how I view spending money on microphones and spending money on coffee. If I had a YouTube channel where I reviewed coffee and earned money on that, totally. The story checks out. Your comment makes sense. But but comparing something that earns me money to something that is that costs me money and I earn nothing in return, very different. Okay, that is it for that comment. Thank you very much. Next, we have two comments. I just wanted to share this. The first one comes from Dr- Dracomis. He says, first, dude, you sound great on the TLM 49. That is your mic. Sounds great on you. And TechMed Raina Richter, he says, hi, Bandrew. The TLM 49 isn't just a great mic. It suits you so well. Thank you both very much for the comment. I really appreciate it. And I always love hearing what microphones you guys like me on the best. The TLM 49 undoubtedly sounds great. Another microphone that I get comments on a lot is the Neumann KMS-105. Then there's the U87. I don't think anybody thinks I sound the best on that, but it it sounds familiar now. That is kind of the baseline. So those are the... Th- I know they're all Neumanns. The SM7B is like my home base. That is the one that I just think sounds... It sounds like a worn-in sweater to me. If that makes, that doesn't make sense to anybody. (laughs) But thank you both very much. I really do appreciate it. That is it for the comments. Now we are jumping to value for value because this is a V for V podcast. What that means, I do not put the show behind a paywall. I just throw the show out there. I try to make them as good as I possibly can. If you get any value out of them, I just ask you return that in whatever way you're able, whether it be time, talent or treasure. I stole this format from the No Agenda guys, Adam Curry, John C. Dvorak. So thank you to them. Today, we're, or every week, we are focusing on those who support the show financially. The support of these people keeps this show ad-free. So if you enjoy it ad-free, leave a thank you for these people in the comments down below on YouTube. Say, hey, thanks very much. I, did, I liked not seeing advertisements. Appreciate you. First V for V comes from Liberty Dude. He says, I find the travel discussion interesting. The why or what one wishes to get out of it determines the how. When I saw you were going to BNH New York, I thought you would make a week of it. Run around with Tom Buck and possibly others, grab a meal together, collaborate on a video or two, podcast, BNH tour, and maybe go to a couple tourist locations. No one should second guess the why one decides as they do, just as it is with our tastes in fiction material. What we value being such a personal thing is often going to be misunderstood by others, and there is nothing wrong with that. I am so glad that we don't have advertising on this show because I'm pretty sure advertising is some form of MK Ultra. It's mind control, it's brainwashing. Because as I was preparing to respond to Liberty Dude's $10 super thanks, thank you by the way, a jingle popped into my head. I don't know what company it's from. I'm sure the company is Liberty. I don't know what they do. But I need to sing this or I will explode and I apologize. Liberty, 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 liberty. That is deeply upsetting to me. That just reading a name popped that into my head and made me need to sing that. That is a that is deeply upsetting. <laughs> so I am really glad this show no longer has advertising on it. Liberty, thank you for the 10 USD. 
I think that was very well said. We all have different motivations for travel, and that motivation is going to impact how we decide to approach it, what we plan on doing, and how we allocate our travel budget. Well said. Had I not just previously done four days of PTO to go travel somewhere and do a charity concert, I would have totally planned to be out in New York for a full week and make it this huge vacation, hang out with people, collaborate, make videos, make podcasts, do tours. I would have loved nothing more than to do that. But I had just taken four days of PTO. My day job is a call-in. Those numbers ain't going to crunch themselves. And if, if somebody doesn't get their report, hey, where's my report? Give me right my report. Where are we financially? Crunch those numbers. So that is why I did not plan on that, which I'm kind of glad I didn't plan on. Had I planned on being out there for a week for a whole vacation, I would have been so much more disappointed that Delta Airlines boned me. So not just boned me, boned everybody so hard by shutting down their entire system thanks to the CrowdStrike issue, which I've seen a few articles. Hey, we're CrowdStrike. And uh, yeah, it wasn't us that caused that Delta. That's on you, Delta. I'm sure they're just saying that to try to save themselves from a massive lawsuit, or maybe Delta is just completely incompetent. I have no idea. But had I planned on doing exactly what you outlined, which is what I wish I could have done, I would have been... I was really disappointed I didn't get to go because I wanted to meet up with Tom, hang out with Tom, do that podcast in person. That was extremely disappointing. Had I had other plans to go meet up with people, collaborate, make videos with people. I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't know if anybody's disclosed where they're from, so I'm not gonna say. Other YouTubers, I would have been so much more disappointed. Thank you very much for the 10 USD Liberty. I'm not gonna do it. We have another 10 USD from Liberty Dude. He says, a month ago when I was asked to take part in the YouTube beta community note thing, I got a nasty taste in my mouth. The idea angered me. One more step down the big brother path. After rejecting the invite, I went to your Discord to discuss, but I couldn't find a civil tone to speak in. Even after a month, I find it difficult. If one has something to add, disagree with, etc., leave a comment below. Don't go to platform mommy wannabes to red flag your way to the top. If one thinks the information is wrong, make your own video or tweet. We need to stop letting Karens reign. Liberty, thank you very much for the second $10 super. Thanks for give me. I needed to stand up. I was getting a bit restless and I needed to move around a bit. I find this whole community notes thing really interesting because it seems like we've seen pretty much every single social media platform start to roll this out where they allow the community to make notes upon other posts. And the way that I interpret this is it's kind of a cover our rear ends kind of thing. Hey, we're not biased. Look, there's a correction right there. See, we didn't want the outcome that came. We wanted correct information. But then I started thinking about it a little bit more, a little bit more. What are all of these social media platforms regulated or guided by? Section 230, the platforms cannot be sued for user-generated content. So if the platform, if YouTube, if Facebook, if Twitter puts up a correction and says, here's the correct information that we are providing, then they may be liable for that information. But if you let other users generate the correction. Section 230 says Twitter, Facebook, YouTube cannot be sued for that. They are not liable for that information if they moderate in good faith. So I think that may be what it comes down to. They are trying to cover their rear end and say, yeah, we don't want mis and disinformation. See, we have corrections. But then if the correction is misleading as well, they can't be, they cannot get in trouble for that because the correction was also user generated. 
So I think they're using Section 230 to their advantage. That's, hang on. I actually, since I have this, we can actually do this in real time. This is, this is, this is me. Is this the thumbnail? <laughs> is this the thumbnail for the, the podcast? <laughs> I do, yes, I do keep a tinfoil hat on my light directly behind me. To anybody who thinks that I am not full in on, <laughs> on conspiracy theories, oh, he, should, he, should, he doesn't. I took the tutorial from Alex Jones on how to properly make a tinfoil hat and this is it. This is it. This, this is the, the, I do know the way, and this is it. To anybody who skips the value for value section, they're going to be so disappointed. This is top tier content, top quality content, worth every penny, in my, <laughs> in my opinion. Of course, of course, I find myself funny. Hopefully, you enjoy this as well. The last super thanks we have comes from Tech Med Raina Richter. He says, 50 euro. He says, Danka Orwell would have loved context cop and information police for misuse. Raina, thank you so much for the 50 euro. I really do appreciate it. Your support continues to baffle me and amaze me. It helps keep the bills paid, keep the lights on, keep the hosting up, keep everything running. Keep this show ad free. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. As far as community notes or context cop and the info police being right up Orwell's alley, absolutely. <laughs> Orwell would love context cop and info police because you can always skew information and context to your favor. Newspeak. Yeah, it would be like newspeak, kind of. I appreciate the support, and I think you're exactly right. Both you and Liberty seem to have that same kind of thought. It's kind of Orwellian. Hey, they didn't tow party lines. Their statement did not meet required vocabulary standards. This must be revised. Kind of scary, maybe a little bit. But I also think it's just, I think it's these platforms. They're not doing it for that reason. They're just saying, hey, don't sue us. I didn't say it. It was that guy over there. It was that user over there. It was that Bandrew Says Podcast guy. He said it. Go after him. Don't, don't touch us. We're just YouTube. All right. <laughs> Next, we have, that is it for the value for value. We do not have Ask Bandrew, but we do have a weekly recommendation. I'll go with them. How does the thing in uh, Princess Br- I just said, uh, Yuck! Yuck! I never say uh. I never say it. In The Princess Bride. Mowage! Mowage! That's all I know from that. I need to learn that speech. Okay, the weekly recommendation this week is Analysis Paralysis, the album from Four Year Strong. A couple of months ago, I recommended a couple of songs from Four Years Strong, but the full album finally came out. From start to finish, it rocks. It is really good. It is a really well-done rock album. Some of the coolest guitar tones. I believe the engineer and producer is the same producer and engineer who did Every Time I Die, which makes sense because it's got that really aggressive tone that is kind of lacking in a lot of over-polished pop punk. But what this album gives us is it does have that pop punk vibes, but then it has these incredible, super heavy breakdowns. You also get chord progressions and power chord riffs that you just do not hear in other pop punk or easy core albums by easy core bands. It just... It's so unique in that genre. The melodies are fantastic. If you are into heavier pop punk, pop punk, rock, any of that, and you're okay with a, a little bit of rah rah, a little bit of screaming, a little bit of breakdownage, totally worth a listen. I think this band really hit their stride with their last album, Brain Pain. 
which came out in 2020, which is hard to believe because during COVID, I had that on repeat whenever that came out. And this is just continuing down that road of making awesome, unique, I don't even know if it falls in the easy core genre anymore. It is just rock. Really well done, unique rock with pop punk inspiration because that's the scene they came out of. That's my recommendation this week. Thank you very much for coming by. I'm going to wrap up there. Hopefully this lav mic didn't sound terrible. If it did, I'm embarrassed. And that's going to wrap up. (laughs) I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will be back. I will be talking at you, with you, about you, about whatever you want me to talk about. And I will see you then. I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye-bye-bye. Whoa. (laughs) What was that? I don't know. I I stuttered on a B. Bye. Do people... I'm not going down this road. Bye. Boop. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.